This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. We bought a house outside of Jackson in Madison County a few months ago. So I've been back and forth between the two cities, and I'll say my goodbyes to Nashville at the end of this month. I'm a big city girl, and I will miss Nashville dearly. There are some positives about Jackson. It's a small city of about 70,000 people, and the traffic isn't bad. I live out in the country, and I can be to the main shopping areas in 15 minutes. Everyone seems to know everyone in this small city. So for now, I'm a bit of an outsider. Highway 40 runs west from Nashville all the way to Memphis, and Jackson sits in between them. There's quite a bit of drug running that flows through all three cities, so there's some gang crime here. Beyond that, I would not have imagined that Jackson would have had a crime like this. You're listening to Episode 56, David Jordan. David and Donna Renee Jordan lived in Jackson, Tennessee. They had each been previously married, and they had that familiar feeling that their marriage was not working out. On January 10th, 2005, Renee called her cousin, Kenneth, because she was in the middle of a breakdown. Her husband was frightening her and left threatening voicemails. David Jordan was not home and said he was heading to their house. He warned Renee that it didn't matter how much she spent on lawyers because they would not help her cause. Renee's cousin, Kenneth, instructed her to leave the house immediately and go to the police station. Renee didn't want to do that. Her husband already had a few run-ins with the Jackson police. She thought that being at the police station wouldn't deter David from shooting anyone. Kenneth got Renee to agree to come to his house. She had their three-year-old daughter with her, and they sent the child to Grandma's house, ensuring her safety. Kenneth was worried about having Renee's car parked in front of his house, so he dropped it off at a friend's place for the evening. That night, David Jordan called his next-door neighbor Kevin because he was upset with his wife. About an hour later, David had not calmed down and stormed next door to speak with his neighbor. David wanted Kevin to come over and get his wife's dog. Kevin would not get involved in their personal affairs and refused to take the dog. David threatened his neighbor that he was going to shoot the dog right in the driveway if Kevin didn't take action. His words were believable, because when he turned to walk back to his house, Kevin noticed that there was a snub-nosed handgun in his back pocket. David turned back to face his neighbor and left him with a very serious warning. He told Kevin to watch his back, because you never know which way the bullets are going to fly. Kevin took this warning to heart, and called Renee Jordan to inform her of the threats issued by her husband. But Kevin wasn't telling Renee anything she didn't already know. David had left serious threats on her voicemail. Later on, David was feeling bad for the way he acted and called up his neighbor on the phone to apologize. Kevin wanted to offer his neighbor a friendly drink to patch over any bad feelings. Around 1 a.m., Kevin stopped by David's and dropped a half a gallon bottle of vodka in the freezer. Kevin didn't partake and returned home right away. On the morning of January 11, 2005, Renee Jordan and her cousin Kenneth went to work at the Tennessee Department of Transportation, or the TDOT garage. Kenneth was a parts runner, and Renee worked in the office area, which was warmly referred to as the crow's nest. Some of Renee's co-workers were aware of the issue she had with her husband. Before 10 a.m., David Jordan was calling his wife, and instead of answering, Renee handed her phone off to her co-worker. Her co-worker told David Jordan a lie and said Renee was in the restroom. Kenneth didn't stick around and left around 11.10 a.m. to run an errand. Sonny Grimm and Paul Forsyth worked for Ralph's Trailers, and they were on the way to pick up starter fluid for a work errand. Paul was behind the wheel, driving down Lower Brownsville Road in Jackson, which was just south of Highway 40. 
This entire section of the west side of Jackson was a very industrial part of town. People would not expect to see many traffic accidents or instances of road rage. Paul and Sonny were following a green car down the roadway. Suddenly, the two men saw a red Mazda truck drive up a side lane that intersected with the road they were on. The truck blew through a stop sign and smashed into the green car ahead of them, which knocked that car off the road. Paul followed the truck and yelled out the numbers on the truck's license plate. Sonny grabbed a piece of paper and pen and scribbled down the information. The red truck ran another stop sign and pulled into the entrance of the TDOT building. Paul pulled in behind the red truck and dialed 911. The green car that had been smashed into pulled into the TDOT behind Paul and Sonny. The driver of the green car was David Gordon. Paul and Sonny handed him the piece of paper that contained the offender's license plate number. The individual who had been driving the red truck was David Jordan. He had already been inside the TDOT building and was heading back out to his truck. David Jordan commanded David Gordon, the owner of the green car, to leave. David Gordon was upset and refused to leave, not understanding the danger that he was in. Gordon said, No, you hit me. David Jordan responded with, You will, and pulled out a long gun, which had some type of silencer at the end of the barrel. David Gordon put his hands in the air and pleaded for his life, but Jordan just started shooting. Sonny and Paul had witnessed the whole incident and peeled out of the parking lot. As the parking lot incident was taking place, employees from inside the TDOT were scattering everywhere. David Jordan had already done something in that building that terrified everyone. Two DOT employees had been standing close to the steps that led to the crow's nest, the office where Renee Jordan worked. They noticed a man they didn't recognize, who smelled of booze, and walked into the building with his hand in his pocket. James Goff, Renee Jordan, Larry Taylor, and Jerry Hopper were all working in the Crow's Nest office. Larry Taylor had just finished up a telephone call when David Jordan entered their office area and took up a shooting stance with his 9mm handgun. Renee Jordan didn't even see her husband enter the office area as the back of her chair was facing the door. David Jordan called out her name. And when Renee turned around, her husband fired on her. Renee took shots to the stomach, chest, and forehead, then fell to the floor, lifeless. David then shot her co worker, Jerry Hopper. Larry Taylor leapt and took cover underneath the desk. More shots went off, and James Goff went down. Larry Taylor felt the pain in his legs. James Goff was shot in the leg, neck, arm, and stomach. After David Jordan was done unleashing destruction in the office of the TDOT, he said, I love you, Renee, as he walked out the door. 31-year-old Donna Renee Jordan was dead. Jerry Hopper was in terrible shape. James Goff had been shot, but was able to check on Larry Taylor, who had been shot in both of his upper legs. James Goff left the crow's nest, and Larry Taylor dialed 911. Right after he got off the phone, David Jordan reappeared with a rifle-style gun this time. Larry thought he was going to die and asked, Can I leave now? After a brief hesitation, David Jordan said, You can go out. Larry left the crow's nest and met up with James Goff in the parking lot. A co-worker took both of them to the hospital and feared James was going to die if they waited for an ambulance. James Goff was lucky in that major arteries or veins were not severed. Larry Taylor was released from the hospital one day later, and they released James Goff from the hospital on January 13, 2005. After his second visit to the office, the gunman walked calmly back to his truck and drove away. The EMTs arrived at 11.39 a.m. They found David Gordon laying in the parking lot with gunshot wounds to the stomach. His pulse was faint, and he wasn't breathing. They intubated him and lost his pulse on the way to the hospital, where they provided CPR until they could hand him off to the emergency staff. The trauma doctor was able to get David Gordon's heart started again and took him into surgery. On the operation table, the surgeon was taken aback. 
the patient's intestines were like soup. Even if the bleeding could have been controlled, there probably wouldn't have been any small intestines left to save. 41-year-old David Gordon died at 12.47 p.m. When the EMTs entered the crow's nest, it was a pretty traumatic scene. There was a woman who was dead with a massive injury to her head and all kinds of blood around her. The other man, Jerry Hopper, was in terrible shape. He was pale and was barely alive with his slow and shallow breaths. They began CPR on Jerry and transported him to the hospital. He had taken two shots to the stomach. All efforts to revive him failed, and 61-year-old Jerry Hopper was pronounced dead at 12.34 p.m. Sergeant Mike Thomas was rolling down Van Drive in the North Jackson area when he received a call about the shooting. He immediately headed west and eventually spotted the perpetrator's red truck. Other officers joined the pursuit. One officer positioned their vehicle to block the road, and David Jordan hit the officer's car, and another officer pulled in behind him and boxed him in. They took David Jordan into custody. Officers found two guns on the suspect, an intra-arm star 9mm with two in the clip and one in the chamber, and an intra-arm star 45 caliber pistol with six in the clip and one in the chamber. There were also loose rounds in his pocket. In the red Mazda truck, police found a Norinco SKS 762AR with 26 rounds in the magazine and one in the chamber, a loaded Mossberg 12-gauge shotgun, one 762 magazine with 14 rounds, two spent 762 shell casings, a 38 caliber Winchester spent casing, and a bag containing assorted ammo. One officer had known David Jordan for three decades, since Jackson is a small city. When he recognized the officer, David said, She f***ed me over. The officer responded, No, she didn't, David. When Jordan was being transported to booking, he had a lot to say. Jordan told them that he could have cut the police in half because he had full auto on his weapon. His wife, Renee, was dead and full of holes. She drove him crazy by screwing around on him. Well, Renee won't be screwing around on anyone else. She hurt him and tore his heart out, and he's been going crazy for about a month. Jordan shot her with her brother's gun. He felt sorry for his daughters. The other people in the crow's nest, they had just gotten in the way. They were basically collateral damage. Jordan asked how many people he hurt because he was uncertain. When he was booked, he asked if Renee was real bad messed up. David Jordan cried and said that he wasn't crazy, but that he was driven to be crazy. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. HelloFresh gives you fresh pre-measured ingredients and mouthwatering recipes delivered right to your front door. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Every week you get to pick from 50 different meal options. You can swap out proteins or upgrade your meals. You can skip weeks of meals if you need to or change the delivery day. And I've done all those things because I've actually been using HelloFresh for months, long before they've sponsored my podcast. I've been living between two cities in Tennessee for a few months now, and HelloFresh has helped keep my sanity. I don't have to think about anything other than selecting the meals I want. And the best part is that they always have some type of sauce or twist or something that really adds a lot to the meal. And it's something that I would never be able to come up with on my own. And it's my favorite part. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Beyond16 and use the promo code Beyond16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash Beyond16. Promo code Beyond16. HelloFresh. They're America's number one meal kit. Now, back to the show. In the interview room, Jordan waved his right to a lawyer. He wasn't aware of how many people he shot, and again, asked if his wife was dead. He said that he had about five shots of vodka in the morning, but he wasn't drunk. In September 2004, Renee had an affair with a man named Johnny Emerson, who worked in the same building. Jordan found out about the affair a month later. Renee admitted to it, and he forgave her. David Jordan said he had been married to his wife for five years. He has two children from two of his previous wives. Renee has a son from a previous marriage named Tyler. Together they had a daughter named Sydney. 
Jordan said in 2002, when Tyler was 10, he had molested one of their daughters. When the Department of Children's Services got involved, they sent Tyler to counseling. On December 11, 2004, Jordan secretly watched as Tyler was in his daughter's bedroom, laying on his back. He was playing keep away with an object in his hand. And when his daughter would grab for it, he pulled her across his body. Jordan went into the room and stopped it. He told Tyler if he ever touched one of his daughters again, that he was going to put a foot up his ass. Jordan left for deer hunting that day, and when he returned, his wife Renee was on the phone with some guy. Their marriage was really going downhill. Jordan said that when he woke up, he wasn't going to hurt his wife. But then Renee called him from work and was acting like a bitch. Jordan claimed to have been the person making all the concessions and begging with her to make their relationship work. He said that Renee told him that he and his daughters needed to be out of their house by February 1st because she was going to see her lawyer and have them evicted. Jordan claimed Renee hung up on him and that set him off. That was when he loaded the guns with ammo. Jordan left a note on the counter for his family and wasn't sure what he was going to do. He claimed that he was thinking of killing himself and wasn't sure if he was going to harm his wife. Jordan drove his red Mazda truck to Renee's workplace and on the way smashed into a green car. Jordan said that he just kept on driving. He left the shotgun and the AR in the truck, but brought his 9mm and his 45 inside. Renee turned around and said, What the f are you doing here? Jordan said he didn't respond to her, but pulled out his 45 and shot her in the leg to get Renee to look at him. When one of the co workers came to Renee's rescue, Jordan shot him. He said he remembered Larry Taylor being there, and he told him to leave. When he looked at Renee again, she was dead. He said he walked back to his truck, then saw the man with the green car. The man had come at him, pointing his fingers, so Jordan took the AR and fired at him. He didn't remember going into the office a second time, but they found bullets from the rifle inside the building, which confirmed the second trip. Jordan got back in his truck and drove away. He said he was going to kill himself, but the police stopped him with a roadblock and took him into custody. David Jordan said he gave this statement to the police open and freely. He said he was sorry and that Renee Jordan did not deserve to die. During the interview, David Jordan said, Today is Renee's father's birthday. I guess I gave him a hell of a birthday present. The investigator asked if he could put the birthday present comment in the statement, but Jordan said that he didn't want it in there. Police had taken a urine sample at 3.35 p.m., which showed an alcohol level of 0.17%, and it was positive for citralopram and benzodiazepines. The blood sample had been delayed because Jordan refused due to not liking needles. They eventually took a blood sample at 9.50 p.m., which was negative for alcohol and benzos, and was positive for citralopram. The Jackson Police Department retrieved voice messages that David Jordan left on Renee Jordan's cell phone. The night before the shooting, at 10.48 p.m., Jordan said, You're the only asshole on the face of this earth that I truly hate. On January 11th, the day of the shooting, at 2.11 a.m., he said, I'll see you at work, bitch. At 2.17 a.m., I hope you go to work tomorrow, bitch, because you'll be there one day. It may not be tomorrow, but I'll catch up with your raggedy ass. Your day is coming. At 2.19 a.m., you homewrecking, lowlife, sorry mother bitch, your ass is going to pay. A TBI agent executed a search warrant on David Jordan's home. No children were present, but there were many weapons found, including several rifles, a few shotguns, a handgun, and a revolver. There had been a loaded pistol on the top of the fridge. There was a note on the kitchen counter that read, Renee got what she deserved, bitch. I'm sorry. I love you. Thanks for being so good to me. Love you, Shelby, Sydney, Deanna. Thanks, Mom and Dad. You did all you could. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Thank you to Smile Brilliant for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt True Crime. I've done a multi-state move and had four addresses in less than a year. Needless to say, it's been a lot. Many of us have been living through stressful times, and unfortunately, that has created some bad habits, like grinding our teeth at night. 
Grinding your teeth can damage your enamel or give you tooth sensitivities. It's always better to prevent this kind of damage because it's something that's not reversible. An estimated 40 million people damage their teeth from grinding their jaws while they sleep or day clenching at their jobs. If you're a grinder or a clincher, stop over at smilebrilliant.com and pick a custom-fitted night guard using their lab direct process at a fraction of the price charged by dentists. You know, you only get one set of real choppers, so you better take care of them. Use BEYOND at checkout for 20% off site-wide at smilebrilliant.com. A digital model of your teeth will be kept on file, so reordering is easy and affordable. They have many great products. I've actually been a customer of theirs for a while and love their whitening system too. So that's B-E-Y-O-N-D for 20% off at smellbrilliant.com. Now, back to the show. They charged David Jordan with three counts of first-degree murder, two counts of first-degree murder in perpetration of a felony, two counts of attempted first-degree murder, two counts of aggravated assault, and one count of leaving the scene of an accident. He pleaded not guilty. The trial was in September 2006. The state built their case around the solid theory that David Jordan murdered Renee Jordan because she was having an affair with a co-worker and wanted to divorce him. Johnny Emerson testified he worked in the same building where Renee Jordan worked. They had started out as good friends, but then their relationship became more. He said that their relationship was only hugging and kissing in totality. Renee told him that she wanted to divorce her husband, David Jordan. Johnny Emerson told Renee that he would not divorce his wife. He ended the relationship with Renee Jordan a week before the shooting. Luckily, Johnny had been on medical leave and was not at work on January 11, 2005, the day of the incident. David Jordan called up both Johnny Emerson and his wife on a variety of occasions. Jordan told Johnny Emerson that he was too old for Renee and that he needed his ass whooped. Johnny Emerson agreed that he had no business doing what he did with Renee. Linda Taylor was a divorce attorney that Renee Jordan hired on December 14, 2004. She prepared all the documents to get her client ready for a contested divorce, but Renee wouldn't have the money to pay the bill until after Christmas. She also had the lawyer prepare the paperwork for a restraining order against David Jordan. Renee Jordan left a message with her attorney's office at 9.56 a.m. on January 11, 2005, wanting to know the cost of an uncontested divorce. Renee Jordan had a meeting set up with her attorney on January 12, 2005, which was the day after she was murdered. Renee Jordan's mother-in-law from a previous marriage was Barbara Surratt, and she testified as a phone witness. Even though Renee had divorced her son, they remained close. In early 2005, Renee even lived with her mother-in-law in South Jackson. On the morning of the shooting, Barbara received a call from Renee's current husband, and he told her to tell Renee happy birthday. However, it wasn't Renee's birthday, so that was a concerning call to receive. At midday, Barbara called Renee at work. During their conversation, chaos ensued. There were loud noises in the background. Barbara called out for her ex-daughter-in-law and received no response. They sent the bodies of the deceased to Nashville for autopsy. Dr. Stacy Turner performed the autopsy for Renee Jordan. There were wounds to her facial bones, scalp, skull, brain, ribs, lung, liver, kidney, stomach, bladder, intestines, and leg. She had taken 11 shots altogether, and they were hollow point bullets, which are the type of bullets used for personal defense and inflict more damage than an ordinary bullet. The shot that Renee received to the head was fired one foot away. There were two notes found in Renee's pocket. One note had been signed, Your forgiving husband, David Lynn Jordan. And the other signed, Your faithful, faithful worried husband. The cause of death was multiple gunshot wounds. Dr. Amy McMaster performed the autopsy on Jerry Hopper. He sustained gunshot wounds to his abdomen and wrist, which were caused by hollow-point bullets. Dr. McMaster also performed the autopsy on David Gordon. He had been shot 13 times and sustained wounds to his thigh, abdomen, sides, hip, buttocks, and forearm. The cause of death for both was multiple gunshot wounds. TBI agent Shelley Betts was a ballistics expert who examined all of David Jordan's guns. 
and she found the SKS rifle had been converted to fire in full automatic mode, post-manufacture. The trigger had been altered so that once it was engaged, the weapon would fire continuously. The TBI agent said David Gordon had been fired on with the SKS rifle. Jerry Hopper had been fired on with the Star 9mm. Renee Jordan had been fired on by both the SKS and 9mm. Dr. Dennis Wilson was a clinical psychologist who testified for the defense. He determined that David Jordan was fit for trial. However, he lacked substantial capacity when the crimes were committed. David had been brought up in a happy home with loving parents. He was twice divorced and had anxiety and depression, which he medicated with drugs, alcohol, methamphetamines, and crack cocaine. He was injured in a car accident in 1986 and got hooked on narcotics. In 2000, doctors gave him Xanax for his anxiety and Ambien for his insomnia. That year, he married Renee and stopped taking illegal substances, but drank enough that he was an alcoholic. His previous wife was using drugs and neglected their daughters, so they tried to get custody of them. The Jordan's marriage declined in fall of 2004, when Renee started going out, drinking, staying out late, and had a relationship with her co-worker. David Jordan's doctors increased his dose of Xanax early in January 2005. On the date of the shooting, the defendant had not slept for three days and was drinking. The doctor believed that the defendant had a major depressive disorder with recurrent episodes, generalized anxiety disorder, and borderline personality disorder. The experts stated that anything can happen when someone's drinking while taking Xanax because it can have a multiplying effect. Dr. Wilson didn't think Jordan was in control of his faculties when the incident happened. He wasn't sure if it was from the stress, from the depression, the anxiety, the dissociation, the intoxication, or more likely a combination of everything. In his official opinion, David Jordan was substantially impaired to the extent that he was unable to form premeditation. The prosecution cross-examined Dr. Wilson, and they thought the defendant was in control during the shooting. Dr. Wilson said that David was in control before and after the shooting. He wasn't sure about during the shooting, and it was a gray area. The doctor said, David wasn't insane because he knew right from wrong, but he was incapacitated during the crime, which was why he couldn't remember everything. Dr. Daryl Matthews was a forensic psychiatrist who testified for the state. He did not believe that Jordan ever had a severe mental disorder. During the shooting, he said Jordan acted with premeditation. He disagreed with Dr. Wilson and said that dissociation was common and mostly pertained to memory and not premeditation. Jordan recognized someone besides Renee at the crime scene who he did not shoot. This implied that he had the ability to keep people in his mind that he knew and had the ability to not shoot. Therefore, he actively made choices and controlled himself. On September 26, 2006, the jury convicted 42-year-old David Lynn Jordan on all 10 counts, including the murders of Renee Jordan, Jerry Hopper, and David Gordon, and the attempted first-degree murder and aggravated assault of James Goff and Larry Taylor. They also convicted him for leaving the scene of an accident. Many victims gave impact statements at sentencing. Renee Jordan's father testified. Renee was his last living child. His other two sons had already died. Since his daughter's death, he had experienced anxiety and depression. Renee was murdered on his birthday, and he could no longer celebrate it. David Gordon's son testified that his father's death was on his mind all the time, and it was very hard to deal with. David's fiancée stated they had just moved into a new home on Thanksgiving Day. She wasn't able to keep the house after David's death. Jerry Hopper's wife of 29 years said that losing her husband was like losing half of herself. Her husband had been planning his retirement, and they were going to spend time with their granddaughter. Jerry's daughter said that dealing with her father's death was difficult. She was not looking forward to the day where she would have to explain to her daughter what happened to Grandpa. David Jordan was sentenced to death and received a 25-year-old sentence for the attempted first-degree murders, six years for each of the aggravated assaults, and 30 days for leaving the scene of an accident, all to be served concurrently. Larry Taylor said that he thinks about his shooting every day, and people say that he is a much different person after the incident. Larry gets upset more often, 
Eddie doesn't get along with his wife as well as he used to. James Goff said that after the shooting, he avoids crowds and has strained family relationships. He also takes medication and sees a psychologist. David Lynn Jordan sits on death row in Tennessee and has been working his way through the appeals process. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for the links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and sound design were performed by me, Renee. If you like the show, please leave me a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thank you so much, everyone.